So, imagine, imagine you're going for a meeting. You're late, you're rushing, but you trip. It's a small trip, but you're on the stairs. So you fall first slowly, then faster, then faster, then bang, you hit your head. You're unconscious. It's a medical emergency. So what happens next? If you're lucky, you're taken by an air ambulance to a major trauma center, something like King's College Hospital or St. Mary's Hospital. There, the doctors assess you and they determine you've got a severe traumatic brain injury. They take you into the intensive care unit, they put your brain to sleep to try and save it, and then they wait, and they wait, and they wait and see for five days, for ten days, to see if you're developing what's called secondary brain injury. Basically, there's a 50-50 chance. It's a toss of a coin. Do you wake up? Do you not wake up? Do you, are you fine? Are you severe disability? Do you live? Do you die? A one, a zero. I'm a bioengineer, and what we do is try and develop new technologies to try and help us predict the one, the zero. Maybe even to turn a zero into a one. When you're in the intensive care unit, when we first went into the intensive care unit, we appeared to be surrounded by data. There were screens behind us, blinking, beeping. But none of that data was telling us how our brains actually were, how healthy the brains were. And so, instead, we had to try and develop technologies to make this work. Okay? The intensive care staff here are in the dark, basically. They are trying to care for your brain. They're, ca they're caring so intensively for these patients, and yet they have no data on which to base their decisions. So they have to wait and see. Now, that's amazing. I mean, if you take your phone out of your pocket, you know everything about your friends. You know what they are wearing. You know what they had for dinner last night. You've seen the pictures. So imagine that you could use that technology as a way of finding out moment by moment what's happening inside your brain. And that's what we're going to try and do. So what data do the clinicians actually have? So here's an example of one sort of data. This is an x-ray section through somebody's head. And this patient has been hit hard on the head. You can see there's some swelling inside there. And critically, it's pushed the black lines, which are the ventricles in the middle, it's pushed them to one side, and it's squeezing the brain against the skull. That's a bit of information. If you have a whole series of stacks like this, you can build slightly a better picture, so the data has given us a better picture. We can see now, for this patient, they've been hit on the forehead there. The computer has told us, in red, where there's possibly blood, in blue, where there's some swelling in the brain. Now, with this, we can tell where the injury is. But what we can't tell is what happens next. And that's the vital piece of information if we want to care for these patients. So, just imagine that we could build tools that could give us data that could tell us what's happening inside your brain moment by moment. To do that, we need to understand a bit more about neuroscience. So as we fly into the brain, we can see an enchanted loom of connections between neurons. Each spark is a thought, an action, a feeling. But each spark consumes considerable amounts of energy. And that's provided to your brain by blood flow rushing into the brain, bringing oxygen, bringing glucose to keep the cells alive. Now, we can't normally see blood flow like this. But there's one special circumstance when we can. So that's during neurosurgery, because they remove the skull. So you can see the brain. This is my great friend and colleague, Professor Tony Strong, who's a neurosurgeon. Now, sometimes during neurosurgery, you can actually see what's going on. And 
This is a video uh, from a Cosby colleague, uh, Johannes Sackowitz and Johannes Wojcik in Germany. And what we're seeing here, at the bottom, so the first thing that we see are the curves of the brain, right, the folds of the cortex. But we then see this, starting from the bottom, this angry hurricane, and it's a hurricane of blood flow that's crawling out across the brain surface. So what's underneath that? Underneath that are neurons, and they're undergoing a wave of depolarization where every single neuron loses its energy. It then screams out for more blood flow to try and bring it back to life. Now, we can't normally see a picture like this, but maybe we could make some technology that allows us to get that information. Here is a strip electrode. This is a, a metal strip that's placed onto the brain surface at neurosurgery. Each contact then looks downwards and listens to the neurons underneath and it listens to hear the electrical sounds of them firing. And you can see also the little white tube is a probe that we're sticking into the brain to manage, measure something about the brain chemistry. What's going on then? So as that wave of depolarization moves up the strip, we can, it hits the first electrode, and we get this signature of the depolarization wave. And we hit the electrode number one, then electrode number two, then three, then four, as the wave moves across the brain. Now this spreading depolarization wave, as it's called, is really extraordinarily destructive. It's, in many ways, it's a brain tsunami. This is the famous image of under the great wave of Kanagawa. And the neurons, rather like the poor men in the boat here, are sitting there. There's an enormous wave of destruction coming. And we have to wait and see. We have to wait and see whether they live or whether they die. But to understand that, we need more data. So the wave, the electrical information has told us that the wave is coming, but it doesn't tell us yet whether the brain survives. For that, we need some chemical information. So what we do is we take a thing called a microdialysis probe, and that's the white probe, and that's placed into the brain tissue. We then pump liquid through it really slowly, so slowly that it would take an hour to make a teardrop of that liquid. When the liquid comes out of the brain, we carry it in a tube, and it's a, it's a stream of chemical data that goes into our bedside analysis instrument. Inside that, we've got chemical sensors. So each one is a bit like a needle, but the key bit is at the tip. The little electrodes at the tip are about the size of a human hair. We can then coat them with a special gel, and inside that gel, there are reagents so that that sensor records the concentration of just one chemical, be it glucose or potassium or lactate. So the liquid comes out of the patient, goes into a specially designed microfluidic chip, and so it flows past the tip of each sensor, allowing each sensor to taste what's going on in the solution. So let's now try and put this data together. This is data from a real human patient, and we see at the bottom that signature of the brain tsunami coming past. It hits electrode one, then two, then three, then four. But we can now add on to it the chemical data. And we'll start at the top, start with the potassium. Potassium is normally inside the neurons. And what's happening as they depolarize, they're spilling out all of their potassium. And that means the level goes up. And we can see that. We can see the glucose. The glucose is what the brain is desperately using to try and bring that cell back to life. And so the concentration of glucose goes down. Lactate, there's not enough oxygen in the brain anymore. And so the lactic acid level goes up in the brain. So we have this little signature of what's happening to the brain in response to that stimulus. We also see something else here, which is that the wave repeats. And it repeats in these patients again and again. 30 times, 50 times, this wave of destruction hitting the brain. So what effect does that have? So we're now looking at the level of glucose at the brain, from normal going down towards danger levels at the bottom. And the first spreading depolarization, when it hits the brain, it takes the brain glucose level down a bit. But that repeats and repeats and repeats, and that takes the brain glucose level down into the danger level. So we can now put this complete picture together with our data. 
We've seen when there is a problem, that's the electrical wave coming across the surface, but we've seen what it's done to the brain. It's taken the brain glucose level from healthy down to a danger level, where that neuron can't survive. And so it's going to die, and that's going to give us this secondary brain injury. We've completed the picture. And we've done that with data. So we've taken, then, we've used data to take pieces of this puzzle. We've worked out what they are, we've worked out how to put them together to give us understanding. And maybe, just maybe, by doing that, we can save lives. Thank you.